Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker uh, of our three Conway lectures, uh, Aureli Marina, who is uh, an associate professor of medieval art and architecture at um, the University of Kansas. Uh, she taught at the University of Illinois before that, uh, received her PhD in the history of art and architecture from New York University uh, in 2004. Um, she has written um, a book uh, published by Penn State Press uh, entitled The Italian Piazza Transformed uh, Parma in the Communal Age, which uh, also won the Howard A. Moraro Prize for Best Book on Italian Catholic History. Um, so we have two winners of that prize among us, um, and we're delighted about that. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Marina, and uh, we look forward to hearing from, uh, hearing about what you have to tell us. Good. I stand before you a sheep in wolf's clothing. I am not in any way, shape, or form a Dante scholar. I don't actually even work on Florence. Um, and I do not actually study manuscripts, which is what I'm actually going to be talking about in part for today. So I hope that you will indulge me in doing that, because the reason I chose to speak in part about um, a manuscript and a sculpture program is because I first encountered the richness of its decorative program here. I came here, I went to the library, and I was basically procrastinating. Um, <laughs> And I saw this publication. I eventually bought my own copy. So you have one. This is obviously not your copy. <laughs> um, on the only illustrated copy of Giovanni Villani's New Chronicle. And so, as you can see, it's gotten a little bit of wear and tear over the years. So in honor of the Medieval Institute's ability to delight the browsing mind, um, I will be speaking about that. I would like to take a moment to thank the Medieval Institute, um, Tom, um, Thompson and Megan, who have made all the logistics work, and of course, especially Mr. Conway, for being uh, among those angelic people who still support and believe in the humanities. So, it's weird. I'm used to turning off the lights. Mm -hmm. Pretend the lights are off. And where's their clock? Over there. From the Alps to the Ionian Sea. Oh, turn on the mic. I promise I would remember. From the Alps to the Ionian Sea, the Italian landscape was transformed during Dante's lifetime. City after city built new town halls, churches, princely palaces, and magnificent piazzas from which to display them. New circuits of walls defined the boundaries of burgeoning cities, and new castles and fortifications asserted the expanding territorial dominion of city-states and signori alike. This building boom has an established and growing art historical literature, but a parallel phenomenon does not. In the same period, cities and countryside were laid waste by siege warfare, civil unrest, and I guess country unrest, and um, punitive demolition of property. These iconoclastic acts marked Italy with signs of violence prominently encountered in the accounts of medieval chroniclers and, of course, in the accounts of medieval poets. Today, I will briefly consider the extensive building projects deployed by the political elites to reify their rule, and then we'll examine briefly how some medieval artists engaged the theme of architectural iconoclasm. Since we're not only celebrating the Medieval Institute's anniversary, but also Dante's, by all means, let's go ahead and turn our attention to Florence. At the end of the 13th century, all of Florence seemed to be under construction. Dante Alighieri, like most Florentines, lived within a few hundred meters of at least, of at least one major building project. OK, this is possessed. Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't wave it around. Um, half a block from his house on Via di San Martino, now Via Dante Alighieri, more or less um, in the area indicated by the yellow circle. Um, 
Reconstruction of the city's principal, the Benedictine Abbey, the Badia, have been underway since 1288. Across from the Badia, the city government broke ground for its first permanent headquarters in 1255 and spent the next half century remodeling the complex, now known as the Bargello. And if the pointer points, ah, here, I'll just walk over. Spent the next half century remodeling the Bargello, which is approximately here. The Badia is approximately here. Um, the House of Dante, I hate to disappoint you, the Museo of the House of Dante in Florence is not actually Dante's house, it's not actually actually even a medieval house. Um, and it's not actually in the right place. But it is close, right? Um, <laughs> the Museo di Casa di Dante is um, on this little piazza here. And basically, Dante's house is probably closer to the Torre de la Castagna, which is a little bit obscured by the yellow line. So the Badia has been um, rebuilt. The city government broke ground at the Bargello. Um, and 200 meters southeast of Bargello, a new residence for the city's priors, now the Palazzo de la Signoria, or the Palazzo Vecchio, to us. Oh, oh no, not excited. Rose around the nucleus of the Foraboschi family tower starting in 1299. And here, standing for you know, the medieval Piazza della Signoria, the medieval Palazzo Vecchio, of course, I give you the 15th century burning of Savonarola. It seemed suitably macabre, suitably violent, and it also shows some of the monuments that Dante walked by every day. This is the tower of the Bargello. Um, this is the tower of the Badia Fiorentina. Dante kind of lived back here, somewhere off the edge of the painting. Um, and of course, this is the Palace of the Priors, begun in 1299 that we now know as the Palazzo Vecchio, or Palazzo della Signoria. Further afield, work continued on an ambitious new circuit of walls that quintupled the city's intramural area between 1284 and 1333. And that would be the blue line. Um, and you can see how much bigger the city got um, relative to the next oldest circuit of walls, represented by the green line. Um, and in addition to all those projects I've mentioned, there were dozens of other major and minor projects, including the construction of a much larger cathedral to replace the venerable uh, but dilapidated basilica of Santa Reparata. Dante did more than witness this architectural ferment. As an official in the Florentine government, he actively promoted the city's metamorphosis. He served on Florence's Council of 100. You know, it's, it feels very... What's the you know, popular word now? It feels very vulnerable to be talking about Dante in front of a room full of Dante people. Um, um, he served on Florence's Council of 100 in charge of fiscal matters when, on the 5th of June, 1296, it considered a petition to launch one of the most significant urbanistic enterprises in the city's history, the redesign of the Piazza del Duomo, also known as Piazza San Giovanni um, at the time, the square between the freestanding baptistry of San Giovanni and the cathedral. For those of you who are inexplicably and unlikely not as familiar with Florence, of course, this is a reconstruction of the baptistry as it exists now with its octagon uh, font um, and the erstwhile um, Cathedral Santa Reparata, um, contiguous to an earlier circuit of city walls. So the cathedral's workshop and the cathedral workshop's administrators and the consul of the Arte de Calimala asked the commune for permission to expand the confined and small piazza by removing the tombs surrounding the baptistry and demolishing one of Florence's largest hospitals, San Giovanni Evangelista, um, probably intended to be represented um, by this structure over here, despite its inexplicable lack of a hospital type portico. In addition to presenting a physical obstacle to the piazza's expansion, the hospital had been under the control of opponents of the city's administration, which of course made it ripe for um, destruction. As the record of the meeting notes, the newly enlarged and unencumbered piazza would provide urgently needed additional space for public religious ceremonial, especially since that northern wall with a small gate in it um, basically was part of the major north-south um, thoroughfare of the city of Florence. The bigger square would also create unobstructed views of the cherished baptistry and eventually the facade of the new cathedral, whose foundation ceremony would take place three months later. Before the vote, um, Dante reportedly, according to the 19th century um, author, but perhaps 
you know, just a little bit of fantasia there. Dante reportedly rose from his bench in the church of San Pier Scaraggio, a frequent meeting place for the Council of 100, since the communal government lacked a hall big enough for the large assembly, and addressed his fellow councilmen in favor of the proposal. Though the poet's words were not recorded, the petition won the day, with 72 votes in favor versus three against. Dante and his fellow councilmen acted, and I quote, to provide for and procure the beauty and honor of the city of Florence, as the petition exhorted. And what I'm showing you on the screen is um, not a public uh, official event, but a private event. This is uh, the painting decorating the front of a um, bridal cassone or bridal chest for an Adimari family member. The Adimari, of course, being opportunely located um, contiguous in the neighborhood of the baptistry, although this wedding, of course, um, or this wedding illustrated in this cassone, the ceremony illustrated in this cassone, um, obviously is a couple of hundred years after the period in question for us. But I want you to see how carefully the artist makes sure to um, include a clear characterization, a clear uh, portrayal of the exterior of the baptistry of Florence. Um, that is going to be part of a long tradition um, in the arts, as we will see. The council's actions also responded to the civic turmoil that had been rending the social and physical fabric of the city for more than a century. Unquenchable partisanship divided not only Florence, but much of Italy into pro-imperial or Ghibelline and pro-papal or Guelph factions, partly in accordance with strategic, international or regional objectives, and partly in response to local tactical concerns. Towards the end of the 13th century, Florence's Guelph party further atomized into the so-called white and black Guelphs. Intercity warfare and civil unrest were endemic, um, but the capacity to impose order on the physical city augured the building patron's ability to impose order on the community of citizens. And so construction continued. And I cannot go on um, without pointing out, of course, that this is one of the uh, miniatures from the manuscript I just talked about. And I tend not to just show pictures of things as illustrative matter, but in this particular case, um, we really truly have a scene in which the artist is uh, painting in accordance with the rubric, come fu cacciata la parte guelfa di Firenze per i Ghibellini. And so you literally have the Ghibellines running in one side of the city walls and the Guelphs running the other side of the city walls. Um, and we know, of course, that this is Florence because, well, it's a city because it had walls. Uh, number two, it is Florence because it has an octagonal building um, revetted in black and white. Um, stone ornament, um, therefore identifying the city. And of the heraldic emblems, um, the eagle on the left, uh, the black eagle on the left, and this fantastical sort of red eagle on the right, along with um, the symbols of the Parte Guelfa, you know, the cross um, symbols of Parte Guelfa, um, identify um, the actors in the story for us. So the erection of magnificent new buildings um, imprinted Florence with material embodiments of the ruling faction's sovereignty. It was understood that such architectural patronage could be a political boon. Aristotle's remarks on the expedience of such patronage, as in the Politics, Book 6, Chapter 7, would be known to Italian elites. We know it was definitely known in a future century um, to Galvano Fiamma, for example, um, but it appears to have been known um, to others as well. And he writes, um, it is fitting also that the magistrates on entering office should offer magnificent sacrifices or erect some public edifice. And then the people who participate in the entertainments and see the city decorated with votive offerings and buildings will not desire an alteration in government. And the notables will have memorials of their munificence. Now lots of things happen um, to um, sort of 13th, 14th century perceptions of what Aristotle was trying to say here. And um, there's another, you know, I'm happy to answer questions about that later. But for now, let's just um, take this as um, given. Florence's ruling elites were not unique in pursuing an expansive architectural policy um, in their ongoing search for political legitimacy. High on a hilltop, 60 kilometers to the south, which is actually about how far you can ride on a good horse in one day, the city-state of Siena had been rebuilding its cathedral in the new Gothic style since the mid-13th century, despite its own share of partisan political unrest. And for those of you who are not familiar with Siena, um, we have the cathedral of which I speak on the upper right-hand corner and the town hall of which I will speak on the left-hand side of the screen. 
From 1287, Siena City Center was further transformed by the construction of a new turreted arcaded town hall. Oh, there's a cathedral. Showcased by a large semicircular piazza, embellished by a public fountain and an open air chapel completed around 1376. A complex system of fortifications situated along the city's mountain ridges safeguarded a strategic position on the Via. You know, this is actually a good crowd to ask. Is it Francigena or Francigena? Francigena, thank you. Um, safeguarded a position on the Via Francigena that linked the Italian peninsula to the European mainland. And to Florence, it's north, and I'm here showing you um, a gate in Siena's still extant, partly surviving circuit, circuit of walls. And to Florence's north, Beyond the Apennine mountain range, patrons, artists, and builders in Bologna also transformed their city in the course of the 13th century, a period art historians consider Bologna's golden age. If any of you are in Nashville, in the next few months, there's a show on Bolognese art. Um, the first show on Bolognese art in the United States, medieval art, in um, a long time, if not all time. I invite you to go to that. So this cultural blossoming in Bologna coincides with the continual, often bloody conflicts among the city's patrician factions, its burgeoning commercial classes, and regional and international powers. Minor epidemics and periodic famines further contributed to an unstable social, economic, and political situation, yet the population continued to grow and many residents prospered. From the dawn of the new century, Bologna, and we see an aerial view here of the area around the, what becomes the Piazza Maggiore, Bologna's elites managed to act in concert to launch the first of several building campaigns that would forever alter the urban landscape of a radically expanded city. The first was the establishment of a formal government center for the commune, with the construction not only of a town hall to serve the city's administrative and political needs, but a monumental piazza to showcase it. Through the 12th century, comm communal councils have met principally in the environs of the Church of Sant'Ambrogio, which I guess is sort of on the sort of the left, I guess, of the world, beyond the edge of your slide, its executive officers had no fixed abode. Earlier, communal authority had been exercised from the imperial fortress at the northwestern corner of the early medieval walls, and episcopal authority centered on the cathedral complex of San Pietro, also off screen. To express its political independence from preceding leadership, the regime chose to establish a headquarters elsewhere, near the intersection of the most important north-south and east-west streets in the city. With remarkable speed, from 1200 to 1203, the Bolognese commune expropriated and demolished numerous houses and churches at the heart of the city. Super fast, like, it doesn't happen this fast anywhere else. And started construction of a monumental town hall and a new town square, or Platea Comunis, now known as the Piazza Maggiore. The brick Palazzo del Podesta, uh, which you see on the left-hand side, dedicated to the commune's executive office, occupied the northern boundary of the rectangular piazza. It consisted of an arcaded ground story with an upper story hall, reached by means of an external staircase at each short end, a very standard building type for, um, for uh, palaces associated with um, the ruling elites, and certainly uh, very typical of the town halls of the um, upper tank world. Underneath what, of course, doesn't, it doesn't look medieval now, um, but underneath the 15th century facade of the modern Palazzo de Podesta, um, the compound still retains the same basic organization under classicizing dress, um, essentially the arcades um, and the big halls above. It was mostly complete by 1211. One surviving urbanistic feature of the building was its positioning astride a north-south street. In fact, the one leading to the Curia di Sant'Ambrogio, where communal business had originally been conducted. The nine arches of the palace's ground story portico disguised the thoroughfare traversing the central archway. But the presence of the street was emphasized by a daring construction above. Maybe the slide shows it better. Let's take a look. Um, uh, daring construction above it of the tall Torre del Arengo of 1252, which still marks the complex's highest point. So once upon a time, um, there was a road that basically went through here when the building was built that you can still, when you could drive a car through the building, um, if you go through this central passageway and eventually it would have gone, um, you know, kept going north towards the Curia de Sant'Ambrogio. Major, major, major road. Communal construction did not stop here. The Palazzo del Podesta anchored a group of communal buildings erected through the course of the next half century. In typical Bolognese fashion, 
And really, truly, like this is amazing. For the Bolognese, I don't know how they did this. The next edition was also built very, very quickly, 1244 to 1246, to accommodate the growing spatial needs of the burgeoning city government. In its day, it was known as the Palazzo Novum, or New Palace, to distinguish it from the first town hall on the site, um, the Palazzo del Podesta, or Palazzo Vetus. It was given the romantic nomenclature Palazzo del Reenzo in the modern era um, because Emperor Frederick II's son, Enzo, King of Sardinia, was kept a prisoner there from his capture at the Battle of Fosalta on the 26th of May, 1249, until his death in 1272. At first, the Palazzo Novum, um, we see the Palazzo Novum um, as this complicated structure, sort of behind all this, I guess. See, I'll have a better slide. I do. There we go. Um, no, that's not the right palace either. Um, the at first, the Palazzo Novum was a simple brick structure with a rectangular plan, sited a block to the north of the Palazzo del Podestà's western half. Later, the two buildings were connected by a monumental two-story arcaded loggia, which doesn't survive, extending from the eastern end of the Palazzo Novum to the fourth uh, bay of the Palazzo Vecchio. I really, truly must have a better slide. No, I don't. Um, but originally, they were linked by more modest construction and further monumental buildings, including an official house for the Podesta and the Palazzo del Capitano del Popolo of 1255. Now, the relationship between the assorted buildings on the first communal complex is obscured by a medievalizing perimeter wall erected in the early 20th century. But originally, the west wing of the old palace, um, the new palace, the courtyard, the House of Podesta, and the Palazzo del Capitano were arranged in a U-shaped composition that faced westward towards the guild headquarters of the blacksmiths and the tailors. The communal compound's most important facade was the Palazzo del Podesta, which you see here on the right, um, which faced the Piazza Maggiore. The desire for better control of the grain trade may have led the commune to undertake construction of a palace to house the communal grain stores on the upper western edge of the piazza, on what is now the site of the modern town hall of Bologna, between 1293 and 1295. The repeated use of materials such as brick masonry and stone detailing, proportional modules and architectural features, such as the battlements or crenellations that surmounted the buildings, served to harmonize the heterogeneous agglomeration of structures. It is curious to me um, I truly am, I don't understand, I cannot understand it, it's hard for me to understand, that Dante, who biographer Marco Sant'Agata persuades us, visited Bologna twice, once around 1287, and again in 1304-1306, does not remark on any of this at all. He talks about one thing, one structure in Bologna, one, and only one, the 12th century Garisenda Tower. And it's amazing to me because the 12th century Garisenda Tower is the tower on the left. It's now 48 meters. Um, it was truncated already in the Middle Ages because it was already leaning um, quite aggressively. The slide sort of disguises um, the degree of lean. Um, you know, Bologna has a leaning tower also. It's not just Pisa. Um, but he doesn't mention the Torre del Asinelli. That's right next to it. And there are three other towers um, around it that only got torn down in the 20th century. He doesn't mention those either. Uh, but Marco Sant'Agata uh, thinks that um, Dante is, of course, the author of one of the Rime, and then, uh, of course, referring to the Garisenda, well, he explicitly refers to the Garisenda, when he compares the giant Antaeus with the famous leaning tower in um, the Inferno. So what sets the Garisenda tower apart, um, not just the Garisenda, but also the Torre degli Asinelli, 92 meters now, as well as the three nearby towers that I just told you were destroyed in the 20th century, is their strategic position within the city at the intersection of three major streets at what was then the principal marketplace. And Marco Sant'Agata suggests that the reason Dante comments upon the Garicenda Tower, although he mentions no other structure in Bologna, uh, is because um, he was living um, in one of, in, in sort of the commercial district uh, around the tower when um, he was in Bologna uh, the first time. What sets apart the Garisenda and the slightly older neighbor, the Torre de, uh, de Liazinelli, as well as the three, oh, no, I already said that. Um, so what sets these apart is basically not that there are towers, because there were towers everywhere, dozens and dozens of towers in Bologna, as there were dozens and dozens of towers in Florence, as there were dozens and dozens of towers um, in every major city in Italy except Venice. Um, only San Gimignano, of course, retains um, a majority of towers, or some percentage stories, uh, towers at um, normal height. But um, what is interesting, 
Well, that's maybe not that interesting to you, but it's interesting to me. What's interesting um, is not that these towers exist in Bologna in particular, but that in Bologna, they were very quickly um, co-opted by the, at least one of them was very quickly co-opted by the government authorities, and the other one, um, only one of the other ones remained part of a family lineage um, compound um, beyond the medieval period. Um, these towers, like all these towers, their purpose appears to have been both defensive and representational, as they unmistakably signaled their owner's presence and prominence within the city. And I don't know when they took this picture because you were hit by a bus. Um, there, there are literally, there's a major road over here, there's a major road over here, um, and the towers, even now, in the presence of much taller uh, buildings, around the structure still strike the eye as a being uh, enormously tall and um, dangerously, uh, dangerously thin. So as in Florence, as in Siena, 13th century Bologna built um, a new bigger circuit of fortifications in this period also, it was seven kilometers long all the way around. Um, it's known as the Circla. And it had 14 fortified masonry gates or serragni. But this is uh, curious. Um, these gates did not link stone curtain walls, but wooden palisades only. Um, they were surrounded by a moat fed by new canals bringing water from the Sabina and Reno rivers, um, and the palisades were replaced only very slowly um, and only beginning in the year 1327 when Bologna was under the authority of papal legate Bertrand uh, du Puget, um, and they were only finished in the 14th century. So, Italy's late medieval building boom was not confined to Republican polities. As seigneurial authority replaced self-government in many divided cities, newly established lords were eager to affirm their claim to rule by architectural means. When the exiled Dante arrives in Verona in the spring of 1303, in the hopes of mustering Lord Bartolomeo I, the Lascaux support for his cause, he found the Signore presiding over a city center whose magnificence overshadowed Florence's. Verona's hoard of ancient monuments, um, represented here in what is not a 13th century or 14th century map, this is an 18th century copy of a 10th century um, uh, view of the, of the city of Verona, in which you can see the theater, the city walls, the aqueduct, a whole host of ancient Roman buildings dominating. Um, the city get, escape. So when Dante gets here, uh, Verona's monumental environment, the ancient monuments, the 12th century churches, the newly paved streets, um, had also been augmented by the construction of no fewer than five new distinct government-sponsored palaces. When Bartolomeo's uncle, Mastino I de la Scala seized control of Verona in 1259 after the assassination of the foreign-born tyrant Ezzelino da Romano. He and his relatives manipulated surviving communal institutions to consolidate their authority and took over the established seats of communal authority. But it was his brother and successor Alberto, who ruled from 1277 to 1301, who transformed Verona's cityscape during his 24-year reign. In addition to launching a campaign to build a more expansive circuit of walls, he erected a new bridge across the Adige, the Ponte Nuovo in 1291, and he restored the damaged Roman Ponte di Pietra. In 1301, in his role as Podesta of the Merchants, an office that he held for 32 years, Alberto rebuilt the Domus Mercatorum, the wooden headquarters of the powerful merchant council in brick and in marble. And we see uh, the restored exterior facade of the palace. Here, the building, then as now, was prominently sited across from the Palazzo Comunale on the Market Square, um, and it also housed the city's major guilds. Alberto also promoted the construction of the Domus Nova, rebuilt in 1369 and heightened in 1731, to provide lodgings for the Podesta and additional meeting rooms for communal councils directly across from the Palazzo Comunale. The original forms of the Domus Nova cannot be recaptured, but the Domus Mercatorum surviving detailing attests to its monumentality. And again, we see buildings very much of a type. Um, arcaded lower story, uh, uh, second upper story with monumental um, two light windows, battlements across the top. The vault of the ground story portico um, here, as in many other examples, are supported not by bricks, but by marble columns 
and its upper story windows are divided by marble colonnettes. Red and white voussoirs, alternating voussoirs or blocks, ornament its arcades and window frames, and swallow-tailed merlins enliven its roof line. And right here, right now, okay, I just want everybody to know this. Ghibellines, Welfs, they did not have a taste in merlins. Um, 19th century restorers and early 20th century restorers did. And so we have many reconstructed Merlins of one type or another um, across the Italian landscape. We cannot ascribe these preferences um, to their medieval patrons. Alberto completed his redevelopment of the perimeter of the spindle-shaped Piazza delle Erbe, impossible to photograph, the city's commercial and political epicenter by adding a long but shallow structure along the entire upper half of the Piazza's eastern boundary, all the way to its northern terminus, the Domus Bladorum, which housed a public granary, and conveniently in the front arcade, a whole bunch of shops that could be rented out by the city. As a result of Alberto's architectural interventions, the De La Scala-sponsored buildings dominated a sizable portion of the Piazza delle Erbe's perimeter and constantly reminded viewers of the Scaliger's support of the city's economic life and their concern for its prudent administration. Alberto's architectural campaign to reify the La Scala authority did not stop within the Piazza delle Erbe's boundaries. He also built a new palace for himself beyond the eastern boundary of the market square between the Palazzo del Comune and the Romanesque Church of Santa Maria Antica. This palace, um, which you see in the background, uh, formed the nucleus of what would become an extensive seigneurial complex arranged around the new rectangular piazza, the Piazza dei Signori, uh, positioned at a right angle from the Piazza delle Erbe. Though the exact location and appearance of Alberto's palace cannot be determined precisely, because this is a complete jumble of buildings uh, with newer facades on them, it incorporated towers and battlements, potent signifiers of dominion that is government forbid others to use in the piazza's vicinity. When Cangrande I welcomed Dante to Verona in 1312, the Scaliger Signorial compound had expanded considerably. In addition to enlarging and improving Alberto's palace near Santa Maria Antica, um, Cangrande was also the probable patron of the tall palace begun around 1308 that defined the eastern boundary of the evolving Piazza dei Signori, later continued by Mastino um, II. The building, now known as the Palazzo della Prefettura, consisted of three wings arranged in a U-shaped plan towards Corso Sant'Anastasia to the north. The partly restored piazza facade of the western wing, which we see here, had a portico with semicircular arches at the ground level and multiple upper stories with varied windows and the usual Veronese restorers array of swallowtailed battlements across the top. Elaborate trefoil lancet windows articulate the upper stories of its southern facade. Lord Cangrande I and his successors, Mastino II and Cansignorio, who ruled from 1359 to 1375, a little bit um, after our time here, continually elaborated and embellished their predecessors' palaces, as well as building new ones. These were enhanced by the refashioning of Santa Maria Antica, um, a little Romanesque church founded in 1185, Romanesque left Gothic sort of transition, now partly surrounded by Alberto and Cangrande's palaces as the clan's Palatine Chapel. Its exterior cemetery, pictured, became their dynastic burial ground. The remains of Alberto, Bartolomeo, Alboino, and Mastino I rested there by 1311, though the shadowy, sorry, showy elevated funerary monuments of Cangrande I, Mastino II, and Cansignorio post-date Dante's time in Verona. In short, by the early 14th century, the north-south axis of the Piazza delle Erbe, newly aggrandized by elegant perimeter structures devoted to the city's commercial life, and the government's lesser administrative institutions had its counterpoint in the newer seigneurial spaces originating from the palace of the commune at the center of the eastern edge. From there, a series of interlocking volumes and voids constituted by scalarger palaces, lodges, and courtyards of different vintages, all adorned by marble detailing and polychrome painted decoration, um, and arranged around the emerging Piazza del Signore compound, but also going beyond it, past the Palatine Church of Santa Maria, towards the main big road of Corso Santa Anastasia, formed a magnificent um, east-west axis of power in the heart of the city. Although the buildings around both squares today have undergone so many alterations um, since the Trecento, um, 
early modern and even contemporary views of the Piazza, the Signori, and the Scarlet Compact still capture something of the courtly and monumental effect that earned the city the epithet Verona Marmorina a generation later. And here, again, we have a painting by uh, an artist of a later moment in which we can get a taste, potentially, of the sumptuousness of the environment um, around the um, Piazza dei Signori. And we can see the airborne um, archway um, through which we can um, glimpse um, the cemetery of the De La Scala family. I hope I gave you a sense of just a tiny, tiny, tiny little taste of the frenetic pace of architectural transformation, of um, urbanist, urban, urban development that went on in the Lombard Plain and on the Italian Peninsula through the course of the 13th century. Amidst all of this building activity, let's not lose sight of something else. The Verona Signorial Palace Complex was one of many built in Upper Italy. Very few survive today. They included the Visconti Palatine Complex near Milan Cathedral, which was built by 1335, now mostly gone. The Bonacosi Complex in Mantua, built 1273 to 1328. That was partly engulfed by the Gonzaga Ducal Palace, and it's basically invisible. And the Deste Complex on Ferrara's Cathedral Square, built from 1242, destroyed and partly rebuilt in neo-medieval style in the 20s. All that stuff gone. Their effectiveness as expressions of the authority and identity of a particular lord or lineage rendered them vulnerable to appropriation and transformation by subsequent rulers and to destruction by enemies. In fact, across the Italic world, the new constructions of republics and signorie alike were accompanied by notable and continual destruction. Some was presented in the guise of urban renewal, such as the demolition of the Hospital of San Giovanni Evangelista in Florence that we talked about a little while ago to make space for the large open piazza between the cathedral and the baptistry and to facilitate transit um, north and south. Or for that matter, the Bolognese regime's swift demolition of houses to make way for the Piazza Maggiore at the beginning of the 13th century, um, which Bolognese historians um, persuade me were not, the location was not chosen at random. Um, this happened to be the neighborhood um, in which many members of the, uh, the Germay um, lineage um, resided. Um, I take the word for it for now. In other instances, urban centers were laid waste without the pretense of beautification. The product of punitive demolition of property, siege warfare, or unchecked civil tumult. In fact, in the Florence of 1296, um, in addition to presenting a physical obstacle to the piazza's expansion, the hospital had been under the control of the so-called Black Wealth faction, who opposed the city's current White Wealth leadership at the time of uh, Dante's vote. This made it, of course, again, a vulnerable target. The demolition of structures associated with political rivals, like the hospital and many of the tombs surrounding the Florentine baptistry, removed reminders of their patrons' presence and their might from the heart of the city. Punitive demolition of property for political ends um, was not new in the 13th century. It was a practice of long standing on the Italian peninsula with antecedents in distant, distant antiquity. But there are, you know, those of you who are historians of, of Italy, um, medieval Italy know that accounts of them recur over and over in um, the Florentine chronicles, the Italian chronicles of many cities. For example, not quite 40 years before Dante's vote, on the 16th of September in 1260, members of the Ghibelline faction and their allies succeeded in re-entering Florence and seizing control of its government back from the Guelphs after the Battle of Montaperti. Um, at the time, some Ghibelline partisans called for the total obliteration of the city, like Carthage at the Third Punic War. Several sources. Uh -huh. um, little joke there, um, attest that Farinata de Uberti, a Ghibelline leader, courageously persuaded the mob to moderate its wrath, which nonetheless resulted in the destruction of 85 towers, 103 palaces, and 580 houses, according um, to Giovanni Villani. Um, and here I'm going to refrain from reading you the passage um, from the comedy in which, um, in which Dante talks about Farinata de Uberti is um, purported um, courage in this situation. Even the Florentine baptistry narrowly escaped harm. 
following masonry caused by the toppling of the Torre del Guardamorto, which belonged to the Guelph Adimari family, miraculously spared San Giovanni, foiling the marauders of Luna's hopes for its destruction. Why, right? What could be the benefit of such wholesale devastation? Well, revenge, of course. Um, in this age, small sparks could and often did surge into uncontrollable fires. Florentines among you, um, um, and, Flor and Florentines of the past, Dante included, credit the 1216 murder of Bondelmonte de Bondelmonti for breaking a marriage agreement with fanning a vendetta that contributed to the city's division into warring factions for the next 100 years. But there are other reasons for the ubiquity of architectural iconoclasm. Some were practical. In the early 13th century, the legal punishment of banishment was often accompanied by the confiscation of real property. This deprived the banished individual, and sometimes also his family, of valuable material assets. It obstructed the exiles' return to the city, as they would have had no home to return to, and in the socio-political context of medieval Italy, in which alliances were established and reinforced by physical proximity in the cityscape, their loss isolated potential returnees from their closest supporters. Other reasons were symbolic. Um, as studies of the ancient Greek and Roman practices of punitive demolition aver, uh, a man's house was seen as an extension of the man himself. This remains true um, in early and late medieval Italy. The house's erasure by demolition can be considered a form of memory sanction, erasing the memory of the man and his lineage from the cityscape. And the sanction was especially associated with punishment for political crimes, as um, was the case um, for Cicero. Um, as Roberta Mucciarelli observes in a rare study of the practice in medieval Italy, the public act of demolition makes the victim's dishonor visible, simultaneously confirming the truth of the alleged crime. Punitive demolition, then, can be considered a type of ritual humiliation related to practices such as pittura infamante or defamatory painting. Now, there's been an enormous explosion in scholarship on memory sanctions, um, and it makes an important further point. It's not enough to erase the physical property of the offender from the city. Um, it is important to retain the name of the offender as part of the toponym of the newly barren site or the damaged building or the ruin, um, because this amplifies the penalty. It establishes a permanent memory um, of the offender's dishonor by establishing a permanent visual record um, and a person, I guess, conceptual record of their dishonor. As most of us know, Farinata's courageous defense of Florence's physical fabric in 1260 did not protect his family properties on what is now Piazza della Signoria from destruction when the Guelphs returned to power in 1266, determined to eradicate the Ghibellines, or so the story goes. And the area of the city that we're talking about is essentially um, an area to the north of the modern Palazzo della Signoria um, over here. And depending on who you believe, it might have expanded um, backwards um, behind what's now the, you know, the medieval mercancia and um, also further in this direction towards the Badia. In fact, okay. the Uberti lineage's disgrace was aggravated by the decree that the site remain empty as a reminder of their infamy. That's the area I'm talking to you about, which as you can see is still mostly empty now. Notwithstanding the horror vacui of Florentine spatial culture, um, and despite its valuable strategic location near one of the few bridges across the Arno, the Ponte Vecchio. It was the availability of this vacant lot within the densely built city center and awareness of its political associations that partly stimulated the choice of a site for the new construction of the new palace for the priors um, at the time of the Secondo Popolo, um, the one we call the Palazzo de Santa Signoria, or Palazzo Vecchio, in 1299. But punitive demolition was not confined to individual offenders. In a classic example, Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa obliterates Milan, obliterates Milan after the city surrendered to him after a seven-month siege in March 1162. Now, he'd already won, okay? The city had surrendered. He tears down palaces, towers, and houses, raises not only the city gates, but the city walls, and forbids the population to return to rebuild. Um, and in fact, they were prevented from returning to rebuild for uh, almost six years. Only the churches were allowed to remain standing. It is important to note 
that the destruction was not the result, I emphasize this, of a military action against the city, but a punishment inflicted upon the Milanese by Frederick after the city's subjugation. He didn't need to destroy Milan. It cost him money to destroy Milan. Um, but um, it humiliated the Milanese and provided an example, a negative example, um, for other cities that might threaten uh, to rebel uh, from his authority. So in the 13th, early 14th century, conquered cities more typically suffered damage to their fortifications, um, not you know, this wholesale destruction as in the case of Milan. But damage to the fortifications was pretty serious damage um, for two reasons. And would render them extremely vulnerable to siege warfare, um, which was much more prevalent than 21st century um, people um, tend to think. Uh, and therefore, uh, so, and so city walls and castle walls were the most exposed and the most emblematic architectural monuments in medieval Italy. In painting and a sculpture, you represent a castle, by, you can denote a castle just by having a crenellated wall surrounding a keep. Uh, a crenellated wall surrounding the tops of just a handful of buildings suffices to indicate a city over and over and over and over again um, across um, every conceivable artistic medium. Although these iconoclastic acts um, marked Italy's landscape with signs of the violence that dominates contemporary accounts, in the sense of medieval contemporary accounts, very few scars remain in view. In the intervening centuries, new construction has filled empty lots and vegetation has overrun the ruins of formerly mighty castles. Many of the circuits of walls, which had been the Italian city's most potent and proudest symbol, were torn down um, in the modernizing campaigns of the 19th and early 20th centuries. So it's very difficult for an art historian to capture an image of these losses. How do we approach the visual impact of erasure? How do we approach the visual impact of absence? Two remarkable artistic ensembles from the 14th century portray, even glorify, the architectural iconoclasm of the age. Although they date shortly after Dante's death, they give visual form to events during his lifetime. The first work, Um, the first work is a sole illustrated copy of Giovanni Milani's Nuova Cronica, now at the Vatican Library, um, BAV, Kijano, you know, 58 to 96, as I just mentioned. Um, Milani, who was a politically active businessman, not a professional man of letters, writes in the vernacular of his native Florence, as you know better than I do. The chronicle sets the commune's history in the context of universal history, starting with the Tower of Babel and continuing until shortly beyond, before Milani's death of the plague in 1348. The Nuova Cronica was continued by Giovanni's brother Matteo after Villani's death, and it was incredibly popular. It survived in an astonishing 111 manuscript copies. Um, I think someone just told me that in 500 years of English history, um, we had a fewer, um, fewer manuscripts um, of a certain type than that. Some manuscripts contain only the first 10 books of the Chronicle. Um, all of them authored by um, Giovanni, and they seem to have circulated even before Giovanni's death in 1348. The Vatican manuscript is one of those incomplete examples. Um, it ends um, with the death by poison of Enrico Count of Gorizia in 1323. It has 332 folios, and they contain 10 inhabited initials, like the author portrait of Giovanni, Giovanni Bilani here on page folio 16 recto, and 271 narrative scenes in watercolor. Now that's weird. You don't tend to get watercolor. Um, you tend to get cantempra by the workshop of Pacino di Bonaguida. Some Florentine artists, some scholars have proposed Giovanni or Matteo's direct involvement in devising the illustration program um, because it's relatively, at this moment in time, I suppose, unconventional. Those of us familiar with Villani's text will not be surprised to learn that more than half of the miniatures depict warfare or violence, and no fewer than 22 depict architectural destruction. And all I can do is give you a taste of the immense variety of mayhem um, portrayed in the manuscript. The Vatican Bilani has attracted less art historical attention than expected. It's one of those things, it's funny. Um, we tend to 
see the images from the Bilani in the work of people who are not our historians, more often than not. Perhaps because these images are distinguished more by their liveliness than by exquisite facture. Most painters' workshops um, in this period specialized, uh, most painters' workshops who painted manuscripts specialized in religious works. By contrast, Pacino produced the illustrations for Bilani's history, some histories of Rome, and some of the earliest illustrated manuscripts of the Divine Comedy. But the Codex portrays so many historical events. Um, but because the Codex portrays so many historical events, anyone who has spent any time in the orbit of Italian studies has probably come across one or more images from it. On the screen, you see one of the most popular. If you Google, this one comes out on top. The destruction of Florence in 542 by Totila, king of the Ostrogoths, Flagellum Dei, who is figured at superhuman scale on the left in fantastical Romanizing armor um, in folio 36 recto. Like all the narrative scenes in the manuscript, the miniature is framed by a kind of, you know, kind of funky red border. It's not a very precise red border. The colorful figures are identified by their costume, simple attributes, or heraldry, and a representation of the baptistry of San Giovanni, distinguished by its black and white revetment, dominates this scene, as it does 13 further scenes in the manuscript, and locates the action in Florence. I want you to notice something um, very particular. The baptistry is flanked by two towers that are all that remain standing of Florence's masonry fortifications. To the right, a helmeted soldier is caught in the act of returning the sword to its sheath after decapitating Bishop Martinus, eventually saying the same to Bishop Martinus and his two companions. I want you to notice just two things. Number one, this practice of destroying almost everything but leaving some, you know, a little something up is one that continues um, throughout the centuries in architectural iconoclasm, especially for political nature. Um, I, if you think of the images in the press of recently of uh, the ruins of Palmyra, right, where sort of one arch is left standing um, and uh, the Irish has basically destroyed um, the, the entire rest of the formerly exquisitely preserved Roman city. Another important observation, like every illuminated manuscript, the Vatican Bilani's images do not merely illustrate the verbal narrative, but rather form a parallel visual account, including details and even scenes not included in the text and omitting others. For example, no attribute in this miniature indicates the sanctity of the martyred bishop, for example. I mean, he's a bishop because he's a bishop, um, his head, has a mitre, um, but he has no halo. Um, there's no other indication of his saintly status. Um, by the same token, the manuscript has a representation of Caesar, Julius Caesar, receiving the head of Pompey, not mentioned in the text, in any of the any versions of the text. Um, but, of course, it's a standard scene in the history of Rome. And so, quite possibly, you know, the Painters in Pacino de Buenaguida's workshop, like, you know, after you have you know, Caesar going to you know, Egypt, then you have Caesar re receiving the head of Pompey. And so that is what we get in the illustration program. But let's, um, in the bit of time that we have available, um, let's take a look at some of these images of destruction because they represent a broad range of different approaches to the practice of punitive demolition and also to the practice of siege warfare, but astonishingly reveal really precise technical knowledge on the part of the artists. Um, of course, you know, we have representations, as we have in other manuscripts, of um, the machinery of siege warfare. Here we see um, um, this siege tower with, what do you call them? Um, crossbows, um, crossbowmen, um, attacking a city, um, and here you have a catapult that is going to throw heavy stone orbs at the walls in the hopes of um, damaging them. But it is actually really very hard to tear down a massive masonry structure. Um, the image I'm showing you on the screen is one of my favorites. Um, this is not a scene of a violent act, the iconoclasm from um, Villani's own day. This is a representation early in the manuscript of one of two scenes of the destruction of the city of Troy. And I want you to notice that the city is, we, uh, the part of the city is on fire, a building up there that looks remarkably like the Bargello, has flames coming out of the windows in red. 
and the city walls. Um, you know, the military standards have fallen off of the battlements and the city walls. Inexplicably, why are they on fire? They're supposed to be masonry. Um, why on earth are there all these little square holes at the bottom of the city walls? This is a very specific te technical military operation or operation of engineering that was prevalent not only in Italy but throughout the medieval world. If you want to destroy a city wall, if you want to destroy a masonry building um, effectively and quickly, what you do is you prize out with a pickaxe, um, you prize out blocks at you know, what the building meets the ground um, at regular intervals. And then you replace the spaces underneath those blocks with, with firewood, basically, and you set um, the wood on fire. And the expansion caused to the masonry structure by the heat of these fires will literally cause the walls to buckle and collapse. It requires a lot more technical ability than you know, throwing stone balls at the wall. And it's also a lot more effective. But it is, you know, it's risky. You can throw a catapult, you know, you can throw a ball from a catapult from pretty far away. If you want to extract incredibly heavy blocks of stone from the base of a city wall, you have to get to the base of the city wall um, and be protected um, from, well, from, um, from attack while you do that. So the people that are making these uh, iconoclastic interventions in, this, um, in the landscape, and the cityscape, are not the people who are you know, fighting the wars with crossbows. They're not the crossbowmen. You have a professional technical class um, of people who are devoted to the art of demolition. During times of war, they um, deploy their skills to the destruction of property, um, like the city walls here, um, this particular scene of city walls, again, an antique city. But I want you to notice that the uh, wall has been breached here. Um, we see fire consuming not only the base of the walls, but also some of the structures of the interior. And these squads of demolition men um, in times of peace would be involved in campaigns of legal punitive demolition um, in the cityscape or other acts of engineering. Here I show you another, man another image from the manuscript in which the painters in Pacino de Buenaguida Studio, again, are very attentive to the actual reality of how these buildings um, get torn down. It's not just you know stones on the ground, the buildings falling down, the walls. The walls have been torn down. Walls and towers um, have been torn down. And we see that this destruction has not been caused by you know swords, right? It's not swords and crossbows that are doing this. It is men with pickaxes and pliers. And, um, and levers that have essentially uh, destroyed the walls using this technique and are going on to destroy um, the, uh, the building uh, at the heart of the city by means of the same approach. And we see it in great detail over and over and over again. Notice, soldiers wearing military dress, helmets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not soldier. Um, um, people who are not actively engaged in the violent aspect, I guess the physically violent aspect of warfare, are involved in this complicated um, enterprise. And what is even more amazing, um, you know, there's a guy called Richard Nub. He's English. He has written a fabulous article. He's one of these guys who got a PhD, never got a job. But he's written um, some fascinating work on um, the English practice of sliding. Sliding is what you call when you destroy a monumental building, not in the course of warfare, but in general. But in the course of writing this um, analysis of sliding as a practice, he basically makes a list. He's very taxonomic. There are four, you know, four kinds of destruction of buildings. You can set them on fire. We've seen that. Um, you, you can. Um, break the walls by throwing things at them. We've seen that. You can prize out those blocks around the foundations and set them on fire. We've seen that. And the fourth, most dramatic, most expensive, and most technically challenging, well, we're about to see that. Here, it's mining, undermining. You literally would have 
You don't have to get close to the city or the coastal castle to do it. You just have to make a hole in the ground and have people technically capable of digging underground all the way to the walls and beyond. You know, literally putting you know wooden galleries, wooden scaffolding in place to hold the dirt basically um, over um, overhead while you get all the way to the city or the castle, and then you these these incredibly proficient and you know frankly courageous um, uh, miners slash engineers would then bring um, firewood and other kinds of materials of the type and set fire to the galleries, again, causing expansion of materials and causing the implosion of the wall, or the implosion of the building. It is the most expensive way to tear down a wall. It's the most expensive way to tear down a city. And Pachinoli Bonaguida, someone in his workshop knew about it and knew how it was done and bothers to give us a depiction of it. Um, here, in which we see, again, these two um, workers with a you know, lantern sort of illuminating, um, <laughs> illuminating their work underground, underneath the castle, um, going about their business. It is notable, and I'm going to close with this. Um, it is notable that in all of the 22 miniatures of destruction that we see, of, of architectural structures in Giovanni Villani's um, illustrated chronicle. Chronicle. We do not have, weirdly, uh, an image of the destruction of Milan by Frederick I. And in fact, we do not have, in the medieval period, an image of absolute obliteration of a city, except for one case, and one case only. And I'm showing it to you here. This is this man on a horse on the left-hand side with a baton of command is um, none other than Guido Tarlatti, bishop and lord of Arezzo. He was a bishop of Arezzo between 1312-ish, I want to say, um, and lord, well, depends on officially or unofficially lord, um, until his death in 1327. He died excommunicate, by the way. Anyway, here he is um, in the process of commanding, with the baton command, the absolute obliteration of, um, of, this particular, uh, of this particular city. And I want to tell you that it's Castel Tucuniano, but I want to double check because I don't want to screw it up. Um, in any event, um, it is unusual. Um, and it is a singular uh, example of the absolutely, uh, of the absolute ambition of um, the bishop to establish a secular principality that he would then bequeath to his heirs, um, his brother, Pier Saccone, um, and nephews, et cetera. But I want you to notice um, two things. Number one, he is fighting a war. He's fighting a whole bunch of wars. Um, in his funerary monument, we see many, many scenes in which he is in the act of um, directing military operations. In the funerary monument, we see many scenes in which those military operations are comprised not of fighting with a sword. You know, he doesn't use weapons. He's not allowed to do that. He's not allowed to use weapons to draw blood. He's a bishop. But he can wreck stuff all day long. There's no rule about that, as far as I know. And so here we see the destruction of um, this particular city. And we see, again, technical expertise on the part of the painter. The walls have fallen down. The towers have fallen down. But look, I want you to notice how the stones have been prized out of the tower on the left side of that gate um, um, in preparation potentially for, again, for the firing um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the, I guess, foundations um, and the eventual implosion of the tower. Um, I am out of time, so I'm going to leave it there. I would like to simply say two things. Number one, uh, I know that we haven't talked about the destruction of the property of Dante's family. Um, after his expulsion from the city of Florence. And we haven't done that for two reasons. Number one, um, we know, you know, we know, right, um, that on two separate, he was banned, and then he was, you know, banned again, so to speak, um, and that the, the second banishment is explicit about the destruction of his property. But here's the thing, we don't actually know whether the property was actually destroyed. Um, you know, he complains later that he has no money, he's always broke, um, but he was broke from before. And as far as we know, Francesco, his brother was not exiled. And according to Roberta Mucciarelli, um, if somebody 
owned properly jointly with somebody else, and only one person um, was convicted of a crime um, which resulted in punitive demolition of property, the property could not be demolished if it was jointly owned by somebody else. I don't know if that's true. Um, and I'd be curious to see those of you who are legal historians whether you have any insights about that. Um, but as far as we know, really, really, truly, we don't actually know that Dante's property um, was actually destroyed. Dante's family property was actually destroyed. We don't even know if his wife actually went off into exile with him uh, for the whole thing, or only some of it, or any of it. We don't know. We don't even know, as you know, how many sons he actually had. Um, but here's what we do know. If, in fact, he personally suffered um, the consequences of, of laying waste, of wasty, this did not do a single thing to lessen Dante's personal enthusiasm for the practice. In um, the Epistle to the Florentines from 1311, Dante self-righteously augurs that the Florentines will see their buildings crumble beneath the battering ram and devoured by flames. Um, that's Epistle 614. The wanton dispersal of assets and the degradation of the city fabric produced by Guasti, um, despite, you know, Dante's vengeful spirit did not find universal approbation. Time and again, lords and communal authorities were criticized um, in the course of the late 13th, early 14th century for these practices and praised for new building projects and eventually legislation um, forbidding uh, punitive demolition of property and certainly demolition of property as a result of personal vendetta enters the books and um, ultimately uh, curtails the practice, um, at least relatively um, to the earlier period. That's what I have. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to entertain questions. And I have fabulous images. Fabulous images for you. Uh, we don't have lots of too. In which we can see all the different degrees of sliding, all the different degrees of destruction that he commands um, his troops to undertake, um, culminating in the absolute obliteration of Monte San Savino. Right here. Sorry about the watermark. I paid them. They didn't send me the link. Um, I am delighted to take questions. I'm delighted to take um, to hear your feedback. Um, I'm delighted to hear um, your your counsel. Yes. Uh, 